Good evening. As Augustan said, my name is Natalie Ortiz Peña. I'm really glad to be here tonight. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Université de Paris Cité, and I work with in situ transmission electron microscopy. We will see what it means. And uh, I wanted to start by speaking about my journey through science. I wanted to mention that we may be not necessarily born with this idea that we'll be a scientist today, but we go through different stages, right? Uh, so at the beginning, when I was a little kid in Colombia, I, I wanted to be a singer, like many kids, maybe. Then I wanted to be an astronaut. That, well, <laughs> was changing through, through the years. Finally, I discovered science, and more specifically, uh, genetics and biochemistry and everything that concerns life and I decided to study chemistry because for me it was like the base of everything in the universe no it's like what constitutes everything and it was a way to understand what the universe is made of and how it works and so on so I study chemistry and I decided afterwards to join a master in Lyon in nanotechnology and finally I did a PhD in physics and chemistry and now I'm working here as a postdoc and um, to understand what type of things can a chemist study in from the universe I wanted to show you this that we will that we also in high school probably that is chemistry and physics right like it's what rules everything uh, that is around us and it has been divided in different uh, fields and this is only because we are we are so small right as humans to understand the magnificence of the universe so we have divided uh, science in uh, small fields to try to grasp the most that we can as individuals, right? So it, ha there, it has different type of uh, fields, but they are all important for the field that I work on, which is material science, as its name stands for, is the study of the materials uh, that we have day to day, but also whatever that constitutes the universe. And uh, this science uh, try to understand the relationship between the structure, the properties, the performance of a certain material in a device, how to characterize it, uh, how to work on it to put it on a device. So I would say that I'm a material scientist. And when you go to university, you don't even think that, that such a thing can exist. But I'm even more, more specialized than that to understand what I work on. I wanted to show you this scale, what we can see with our eyes, uh, typically of the length of meters, kilometers, uh, centimeters, millimeters, right? That when we arrive to the freckles or the hairs in the hair in our head, we can we can think of uh, the size of it, and we will have microns. For example, the diameter of one hair is a uh, few microns, but below that there is an entire universe of things that constitute this, this hair, for example. So if we go down, we will find our cells, like uh, red globules and things like this, and they are said to be in the range of under micrometers, and then we will have bacteria, we will have the cellular membrane, we would have the uh, lipids that are known in the cellular membrane, and finally, the atoms that constitute these membranes, right? And these atoms are at the scale of the nanometer. But what, what is the ratio that with, with which we could understand this scale? It's like if we, compare, if we compare an atom with a cell, for example, it would be like having the diameter of a battery from our remote control 
compared with the diameter of the Earth, right? But in, from the other side, so from the big to the small and from the small to the big. So it's really a difference of scale, really enormous. So the question that might arise is why we care about these uh, scales in our lives, right? Actually, the organization that atoms have in the materials have a big impact on the way they behave. So for example, if we see these two materials, what can we say about them? What are they? Graphite and diamond. What is the difference between them? And in terms of characteristics and things that we can see, uh, one is transparent, right? Really hard. The other one is black. We can say that, uh, for example, graphite that is on our pen will go away the w while we write, right? Different from diamonds that is one of the hardest uh, materials in there. So we see that these, de these uh, materials are really different, but they are actually constituted of exactly the same thing, which is carbon. These are allotropic forms of carbon, which is a big word maybe, but it only means that this is only made of carbon. In, inside of them, there is only carbon. The way that the carbon atoms are arranged in space, in the case of diamonds, they are arranged like, we will say like pyramids, right? And that will make it really hard to break while in graphite, they are in, in the way of sheets that will go easily in the paper, for example, when we write with a pen. So this is a clear example how the way atoms are arranged in space can really affect the properties of a material and explains as well why we are interested, finally, in understanding how these atoms are in everything we touch, we eat, we see, we smell, right? So how we look, how can we understand and see with our eyes how this happens? So if, we, if I take a piece of the chair, I cannot know what atoms are there, how they are organized. We need really specialized tools. So you might think maybe if I use a microscope, I might see uh, how it is, it is organized. But actually, typical microscopes use light. And light, as you may or may not know, is composed of photons, which are particles of light. Then we go in a really weird uh, duality, but anyway. Um, and these uh, photons are way bigger than atoms. So how can we look at uh, atoms with things that are bigger than atoms, right? So we have nowadays special tools that are called electron microscopes that instead of using light or photons to observe our materials, use electrons that are way smaller than our photons and allow us to see smaller things uh, in materials. So how can we understand the different scales that we can see with different instruments? So here I have a scale of everything that we can imagine in the universe, right? Here is the scale of things that we live on, right? And um, we see that with our eyes, we can see well, animals, insects, hair, right? With a light microscope, we can see cells, we can see bacteria, and with an electron microscope, we can see things that are below what the scope of the light microscope can see. As I mentioned before, this is like trying to form an image with something that is bigger than the actual thing we are trying to see. So it's like trying to form, to detect the details in a letter, for example, with basketball balls instead of little bits of beans or whatever. So this allows us to create a better image and that's what we call resolution. With electron microscopes, we, we can reach nanoscopic resolution. Means we can see smaller things. And so such an instrument is uh, to see such a small things is actually pretty big and it can take an entire room like this because it requires 
a high vacuum. And it means that we, we need to get rid of any type of particle that might be on the air, that can interact with our elect electrons, that we only want to interact with the materials that we are observing. So uh, this is the column of the microscope. It means it would be like the thing that we look on, right, in an optical microscope. And behind the microscope, there is a bunch of vacuum pumps, things that are withdrawing all things that might interact with, with our electron beam that will form the image that we want to see. So this is me on the microscope. So the, in a typical day, we come with my sample, that which will be actually really small sample in such a big instrument. So, I brought here a little grid where we will put the sample. Maybe if the beer, I cannot take it, but I will try. So this is a grid. I don't know if you can see it. Maybe not. And in this grid, we will put our sample, put it on the holder that will go inside of our column, and we will see whatever we want to see, right? But how, how it looks? <laughs> the nano work. So, ah, yeah, before showing some nice images of, that come from electron microscopy, I wanted to mention that it was actually discovered in 1933. It's actually a quite young technique to observe things just from last century. And um, it was a big revolution because it meant that we could finally see beyond. The, what we could see in optical microscopy. And it was thought at first uh, for biological samples. The problem is that electrons and biological things that don't get along very well, but anyway, we will discuss that later. And Ernest Ruska won the Nobel Prize in 86 because it represents a big revolution for the material science. This is the first electron micrograph or, of a cell that might not seem very different from what we cannot get today from optical microscopes, but for the time it was very important. So, if I ask you, what is this? This is the thing that annoys us so much in spring, it's pollen. It's a, it, these are grains, grains of pollen uh, that, that are in the air that we breathe every day in spring and make us sneeze and whatever. And they can have different shapes, different forms, different sizes, because it depends from the flower it comes and the plants it comes, right? And we might not even imagine that the powder that we will see there looks like this. So if I ask you what is this, what would you say it is? It's like a cell, right? It looks like a cell. Well, actually, it's the same pollen that we see here. The difference is that here we have an electron microscope that reflects only the surface of our pollen. So we will see like all the topological means the surface of our pollen with using a, a scanning electron microscope. While here we can see inside of the pollen, right? So we will see all the constituents of our little grain of pollen and we will see what is on the membrane and so on. And the difference is that here we, we the electrons will uh, go back and here they will be transmitted, meaning that they will go through our pollen. So looking at things with the microscope is actually really cool and we, we will never imagine that it is an entire world of small things. So for, for example, here we have a grain of, a grain of salt and this is how it looked like. Um, you were asking for viruses. You, <laughs> this is one type of virus. And as you can imagine, characterizing the form, the shape of the virus is really important to understand how they can affect us, uh, how we interact with cells and so on. Here, there's people just having fun looking at insects because they, really, they look really cool in uh, <laughs> scanning electron microscopy. And maybe you know or you don't know, but there is actually contest of images of electron microscopy. So electron microscope will take their image, um, send it, and they will decide. It's like an art. It's like a, an exposition of art. I brought a calendar. 
from one electron microscopist who love to show their, his pictures to people. I will, I will make it go through. And he just takes different things that we have in our everyday life and take pictures of it and how it looks and paint it and they look really cool. And, and, and he has won a lot of prizes be, uh, with this type of picture. So maybe one time you can think of, instead of a Picasso, you can get a, an electron micrograph of your hair or your nails or whatever. So you can just circle around. Yeah. So uh, what I like to think is, for me, is like, I don't know the different generations that are here, but when I was a kid, there was a show called The Magic School Bus. And the teacher used to, uh, she had a bus that was able to enlarge things or make things really small and go inside the body and so on. So I like to think of like the microscope is like my magic bus and that I can go through materials, uh, recording them and taking pictures and, and understanding how, how they work. Why is this important for our everyday life? Uh, actually, in nanotechnology and material science, it is very important for different uh, fields of application, like what we see here. These are things that we use every day, right? Like, uh, or that will are involved one way or another. Uh, these are just few examples of where nanotechnology can be found, for example, self-cleaning self textiles, aerospatial, flexible electronics, make, um, medical engineer, agriculture, and so on. So this, it is a field that has a big impact in the things that we use every day. And in my lab, we, we have a special device that uh, not only allow us to see materials under high vacuum, which is not the natural environment, but we can also look at materials in their native environment, for example, gas or liquids. That is the typically, typical environment of things, right? We are able to record nanoparticles while they're, they can imprint uh, certain patterns within a material, maybe, yeah, you will see. This is iron, an iron nanoparticle going through a graphite layer and making little holes on the sheet and forming different patterns, which is impor important for electronics, for example. Maybe you, can, uh, you cannot see the video, but the nanoparticles are moving around. And we can also print things, meaning that we can move nanoparticles around in our material and we can record how they do that. We can create small patterns within different materials and we can observe the, the dream of every chemist that is looking inside of a reaction and seeing the atoms interact with each other. So if you have a solution, your beer, whatever, and you take a drop and put it on the microscope, you might see something like this. So this is a reaction mixture of iron oxide nanoparticles. So we are forming the nanoparticles within a solvent. And with our microscope, we are able to see how the different molecules interact to form our final nanoparticle that, that will be in this shape. So, uh, usually, and I like to mention that uh, science is constituted mostly of failure. <laughs> Most days we don't see the things we want to see. It's really tough, we don't see anything. But the day that you succeed and you see, this, you get this video and you are the first person to see with your eyes what is happening is really exciting. So that makes us, like, keep us motivated through the failure, right? So I like to show this video because it is not only about any type of materials, but materials that might be important for biomedical devices. For example, we have sheets of molybdenum disulfide, which doesn't matter what it is, it's just a sheet of a material that is used in uh, miniaturized electronics to implant, for example, in, in this, under the skin. And here we made a test with uh, mice 
uh, to take the to inject it on, on the mice and see what would happen because we need to understand how materials can change within our body once we implant it, right? So we took the lungs from the mice and we found these things that look like scrolls of our sheets. We, we didn't really know what it was. And so we tried to simulate this reaction within the microscope. So we have a sheet like this one in a liquid and we look at it and we will see how it, it bends and it scrolls and that's what it does in the body. So if we put this type of material within our body, our cells, it will just scroll up and form like the things that we will see here. And this was not understood until we put it on our liquid and saw, saw it through the microscope. And it's important to understand that this material is not, um, is not toxic for the body, but it just scroll and stays there and then we will eject it from our body and that's it, right? So I don't know how many of you are scientists, but I like to finish by talking a little bit about the day by day life of a scientist. So what we typically we do as microscopists would be to prepare our samples, right? Uh, see how the sample is align the microscope, meaning that we will see that the beam is correctly aligned, that we will have a really nice image, like when we make focus with our camera and so on, exactly the same, just that with the instrument. And then we will take a bunch of pictures, try to decide which one is the better uh, that represents our sample, then try to understand what happened, what means the picture that we took and so on. Uh, we go to conferences, or we, we talk to other scientists, uh, present our results, uh, we make posters and we publish in scientific journals that allow us to uh, understand if other people are doing the same as us, where, where are they and how can we move forward to understand the, the universe. And that's pretty much it about the electron microscopy. Feel free to ask any question, I'll be happy to answer. And that's it.